Hello and welcome to the History of Jackson podcast. Today we are talking with Chris and Rosie from the Historians magazine about LGBT plus history. Rosie and Chris are two incredibly talented young historians who are making waves in the history world with their work at the Historians magazine, their podcasts and their research. So hi to both of you. Thank you very much for coming on. And how are you both? Hi, Jackson. Yeah, I'm good. It's great to be on the podcast and be discussing the magazine. Um, this is a really exciting edition that we have coming out, so I'm glad that we get to chat about it. Yeah, and how, yeah. how are you, Chris? Yeah, I'm good, thank you, mate. Yeah, and to, to echo what Rose has just said, we're, we're super excited and, and super proud of this edition, um, and we're really excited for people to uh, to read it. Yeah, and I know we've done, oh, particularly you guys, I've just joined, but you've done a lot of work in building up the Historians magazine from something that was relatively small at the beginning to what is becoming a growing force uh, in history magazine and publishing at the moment. So, you know, I'm incredibly proud to be friends with you both and have watched that grow. Now, personally, we've seen the progression of the Historians magazine and we've seen how it's grown and there's more contributors and more people wanting to contribute now. But what is the magazine and and why did you start it? Uh, I believe Rosie had a, a, a crucial role in this. Yeah, so I set up the magazine um, last year in, well, actually not last year, the year before, um, in December 2020. Um, basically, I was kind of on and off furlough at work um, and I was bored, essentially. Um, and I kind of just saw like a gap where people were kind of wanting to write things, but didn't have anywhere to publish it. And, you know, submitting to, I don't want to say proper magazines, but you know, established magazines, you have to be kind of a qualified historian and maybe have a degree or, you know, a PhD. Um, and I kind of wanted something where people could submit that were just passionate about history, um, rather than actually being qualified and I don't think that takes away from anything in the magazine I think if anything it makes it even better because everyone's so passionate about their topics they just want to do it justice no I can I can, I can completely like emphasize that you know um, I myself contribute to the magazine to to build my own CV and actually start writing about history uh, and it's really great to have that place for historians where no one's punching down which I quite like. I think, Chris, how how did you get involved in the magazine? Yeah, I mean, I actually uh, I wrote in the first edition that that Rosie did um, on her own. So back in December of of twenty twenty, um, I wrote a piece on the coronation of William the Conqueror, and I actually got something wrong in it. And I feel like Rosie's refusing to change it, um, but I referred to Odo of Bayeux as the um, what did I, I said he was the um, the Earl of Kent when he definitely wasn't. I don't know where I pulled that fact from or that lack of fact from, but it's still there for you to read online. My blatant error. Um, but yeah, for some reason, then after that, Rosie then um, put out a, a request and yeah, for some reason said that I could be part of the team. Um, but no, in, in all seriousness, it's been um, it's been a wicked uh, experience these last whoa, just over a year now, or just under a year. Sorry. Um, and I'm, I'm very, very, very proud to, to, you know, as someone that currently is studying a history degree, so I don't actually have a degree yet, um, like Rosie said, um, you know, give a platform to people that wouldn't necessarily have the confidence or, you know, the qualifications um, to, to put themselves out there. Uh, it's given me a whole lot of confidence um, and it's really, really nice to see um people use their work that they've put in the magazine uh and you know spread it out there you know like you know like you said jackson you know, if it's on people's cvs then awesome we've 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 done something um because it's you know if it gets somebody a job or you know it gives them a little bit more confidence to talk about what they're passionate about then then we've all won yeah it's a it's a great thing for everyone really there's there's young historians writing in it who are wanting to get into university and study it and there's there's been people who have PhDs writing in it as well, and I think that's that's an absolutely fantastic breadth 
of knowledge and expertise uh, kind of shows it off as a magazine for all really now the next edition um, of the magazine is on LGBT plus history now obviously this is a uh, an area of history which is only starting to gain light uh, and attention so why why did you choose to focus on this in this newest issue um i mean one of the reasons that we chose this topic is because uh february in the uk is like pride month lgbt history month um so we really wanted something to tie in uh with this important month because obviously black history month is becoming quite a growing thing in the uk but i also think so is lgbt history month so um we thought this would be a great time to um show off the lgbt history because you know in all of the editions of the magazine i think we've only had one um article dedicated to lgbt history so in I think we've done five editions and we've only had one. So I really wanted to make sure that we had something dedicated to this topic. And, and, and rightfully so, um, especially coming up to LGBT History Month as well. And it's so important to get these stories out. What, what stories did you think were important for people to learn about, Chris? Well, I mean... In, in terms of just basic numbers, um, the Office of National Statist Statistics sorry, um, reported that over 1.4 million people in the UK alone identify as, um, and I'm going to use their uh, terminology, as lesbian, gay or bi. Um, so that's a massive part of our, you know, of part of the country. Um, and, you know, generally speaking, we thought it was really, really important to uh, include everybody in the uh, in the historical debate that we're kind of uh, forever on uh, at the ma on the magazine, and um, you know, we, we the the point of this edition is obviously to shed the light on you know as much history as we possibly can um, that encapsulates things for going back all the way to you know ancient Greece um, with Achilles, all the way up to um, you know um, more uh, more recent. Um, you know, developments, um, including, you know, Virginia Woolf um, and Alan Turing as well. So we, we wanted to be as open and as broad as humanly possible to allow, you know, to essentially as, you know, the kind of the backbone of this magazine is to, you know, allow everybody in and everyone should feel welcome to contribute or to read or, you know, feel like they're represented. And, you know, as we, we, we've done with, um, and we will continue to do with, um, our International Women's Month edition uh, last year uh, and we've got plans for other editions later on in this year. I'm not going to give too much away uh, but like I said it's it's purely to you know shed a light on as many different people from across the globe across any and all spectrums uh, as humanly possible. And, and, and I love I love those ideas of making history representative and giving these people a voice who necessarily didn't have or didn't necessarily have a voice uh, back in the past and I do want to echo Chris's sentiment there that there are some fantastic uh, additions and topics coming up in the coming few months that I know you guys are really going to love now interestingly there we touch upon the past and silenced voices that didn't necessarily have the means or the right to have their identity shown or out and proud in public um rosie ancient history what what would is it what was it like to be a member of the lgbt community um i mean it depends on kind of which area of the world and kind of which area of um you know the past we're looking at i mean in ancient greece it was actually very acceptable to be homosexual um it wasn't something that was taboo like it would be today or like it would have been you know say maybe 200 years later um which um is obviously sorry That's <laughs> right. is obviously um 
very interesting to think that maybe you know further a further time ago people were actually more open to the concept of lgbt i'm like i'm not convinced like where when when did we start kind of you know judging it i think you know maybe the rise of kind of different people taking over different areas and stuff like that then meant the view of sexuality kind of changed um because when we get into kind of the medieval period it was then frowned upon so it wasn't a very long time jump um in between kind of changing attitudes which i find really interesting because you would have thought the further we look back the more they would have frowned upon it but actually that's not the case and it's interesting to see that and I, I know i've mentioned it quite a few times on my podcast and other people's but interesting to see that encyclical or cyclical idea of of history with views coming back and in and out of fashion and and definitely their medieval attitudes towards lgbt people is a term that is used in the media um can you can you tell us chris of any individuals who you know have either been i'm not not entirely sure what the word is straight washed from history yeah absolutely i think that's probably a good way to um good way to phrase it um yeah as, as rosie mentioned obviously when we're, we're getting into the the medieval period um ideas of sexuality and and sex and gender are becoming more organized into um you know camp a camp b uh, if that kind of uh, makes sense um sex um, and therefore sexuality was was very much driven by uh, gender roles um and you know a man and a woman had very different um essentially had very different roles uh, when it came to sex procreation uh, you know recreation uh, obviously that's a whole other topic a whole other podcast in itself but um yeah, in terms of uh, straight washing, as we'll call it, um, three people, three three kings of England that I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, one of them, we do have a, um, an article in this edition uh, coming out uh, on Edward II, who's probably the most well known of the. And I'm, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm I'll preface everything with um, you know I'm, I'm going to go with the, what the majority of, of historians and commentators would say, and let's say he was probably gay. Uh, I probably err on the side that he was most definitely at least bisexual. Um, but there's also uh, Richard the Lionheart. There are uh, several rumours of his potential bisexuality. Um, and again, the son of uh, William the Conqueror, William Rufus, or William II, um, was also thought to be um, homosexual um, and an atheist, um, which if anybody knows anything about the 11th century is a you know, two pretty bad things to be. Um, but these are just three well-known cases. Um, obviously, anybody that studies the medieval period or, or even really has a passing interest in it will, will know that, you know, kings and to a lesser degree queens get quite a lot of the stage time, whereas the regular folk um, and anything outside of war, conquest, you know, marriages and things like that, not much of it is well-known. So I can only imagine that there were you know, scores of people that would would consider themselves, if they could do today, uh, members of the, you know, the LGBTQ uh, plus community. Um, but I think one fi thing I found with studying um, the, you know, medieval England and loosely into, you know, sexuality and gender and things like that is, I don't really think it was as understood as it is maybe maybe today. Um, whereas in, you know, like say ancient Greece, it was it was considered part of, of normal life. Um, whether that was completely consensual is a is a debate for another podcast again, because um, in, in a lot of cases, unfortunately, it wasn't. But you get to the medieval period, you know, order is very important. Uh, you know, everything the feudal system requires uh, laws to be followed and order to be, you know, um, maintained at all times. And any straying from that path would, would lead to would lead to issues and you know sexuality that wasn't heterosexual um, you know sex for procreation was was seen as you know breaking that order and was 
was considered pretty bad, to be honest. It was, um, yeah, it was, it was probably a very, a very difficult, very confusing time to, to, to be uh, a member of that uh, community. And, and especially as there wasn't a, I don't really want to say the word label, but there wasn't a name mm. that you could put to your feelings. There wasn't anything that you could identify with to kind of help these feelings that you were having. Um, you know, even the word bigamy was put it, not bigamy. Um, sodomy was in law and had negative connotations mm. based on Christianity. Now, we're, at the moment, we're focusing on the medieval period and it's important for us to, re uh, to realise and understand that these kind of attitudes and this hiding of it of identity isn't something that's exclusive to the medieval period and it's actually in living memory so rosie you know how how recent was it that people were still hiding their, their identity and, and these relationships and people being who they are was actually something that was taboo or even illegal in some cases yeah so actually in the uk um like being gay wasn't legal um, until 1967, which for many that is in living memory. I mean, that's not that long ago. Um, and basically so, this legalized home homosexual acts. So. And that, even, that was the, even the year after England won the World Cup. So it really puts into perspective for some people. Yeah, definitely. And also the thing to note about the 1967 date is that it was only for people over the age of 21 so for consent for um for heterosexual couples or you know heterosexual sex that is 16 which it always has been uh, well not always has been but it had been for quite a number of years up until this point so actually there was still a restriction in for homosexuals and for that to be in living memory of you know, even one generation above some of us or two generations above some of us is, you know, it's it makes things incredibly real. And we're still dealing with the aftershocks of, of these kind of decisions. But so far, we have focused on male homosexual relations and, you know, how men, men experience this and, and male figures. Was... It is equally as taboo in the medieval period and within living memory of, you know, women um, uh, being homosexual, women, lesbian relationships. Was that is that something that's been portrayed the same? It's a great question, to be honest, because and I'm hoping someone is going to be able to prove me wrong who's listening to this or or, or prove otherwise. Anyways, I, I very, very seldom come across it if at all, you know, like I can think of people off the top of my head, I can think of um, men who have been accused or were most definitely at least bisexual or gay. Um, whereas when it comes to women in the medieval period, at least it's, I, I genuinely, I can't think of um, a, a single case. And I truly think that's because up until, up until very recently, being a lesbian wasn't necessarily treated the same as being gay and that's neither good nor bad um it wasn't until 1921 that there were attempts to um make um female homosexuality illegal um and they didn't actually pass that act because they didn't want women to start exploring their own sexuality um which is such an odd kind of concept that you know, even in the 20th century, that we were still umming and ahhing on definitions, when realistically, it's, it's a lot simpler than that, you know, like, not to get too preachy, but love is love, isn't it? And it, it shouldn't matter. And yet, you know, we were, we were arguing over what it was to be this and what it is to be that. And, you know, I, I just don't, I don't think there is, back to your original point, I very, very seldom, if at all, have come across any real examples of um you know uh, of lesbians or you know women in the medieval period in medieval england 
um, experimenting or even even really mentioning it at all. It's obviously uh, we're going down a little bit of a rabbit hole here, but you know, women in medieval England, or most of medieval Europe, were considered, for lack of a better phrase, you know, second-class citizens within their own situations, and it's very rare that we actually get um, you know chronicles mentioning many women you know there is there is a period of about 20 years in Eleanor of Aquitaine's life where nobody has any idea what happened there just is not a a record anywhere um, and she's arguably one of the most you know famous women in all of medieval history so I don't think if it I absolutely I'm 99% sure that it will have 100% happened I know I said 99 and then 100, but whatever. Um, I'm, I'm sure it will have happened because, you know, people, you know, people don't really change, do they? But I'm really hoping someone can, you know, show me some examples of this, but I really have never really been able to find any. And it's, and it's interesting to see that they, these kind of things weren't, weren't important enough to note down. And yet mm. you have medieval kings, you have nobles, uh, knights being accused uh, and put on trial for these kind of relationships. Uh, and it's it's interesting to see the difference in the way these people were treated. Now, in in more modern history, uh, these kind of relationships between uh, lesbians have been characterised in a different way and hidden in a different way by themselves. Rosie, in more modern history, how have um, you know, women in lesbian relationships hidden their relationships during and and after their death yeah so i'd say um one of the most famous examples in kind of recent times that have has come out recently is Anne lister um she's very famous um for being a lesbian um there was a bbc show gentleman jack about her recently um but she kept diaries of her of her life um which included a lot of um you know details about her relationships which is how they know categorically you know she was lesbian it wasn't just she was living with her friend or some other you know way that people try and say that someone's gay without saying that they're gay um she you know detailed her relationships with these women um in her diaries but she actually wrote it in code so um and i think she hid it in one of the walls um and a relation of hers found it however many years later um and he cracked the code and someone actually said to him oh you should destroy these like this is not what you want coming out about your family but he decided you know put it back in the wall and just wait for someone else to find it um and they did and i think it was over a million words she wrote which wow. um someone has you know, I can't remember the name of the historian, but she basically um, translated it all, wrote it all down. Um, and so there's this massive resource about Anne Lister. And she actually, in her eyes, she was married to her, her wife. Um, obviously, in a legal sense, that wouldn't have been a real wedding. Um, but in her eyes, she was blessed by the church for them to be married. So she was very... Um, you know, out there, she was, I mean, I guess people probably suspected that she wasn't straight because she always lived with women. She dressed like a man. Um, so I don't necessarily think it might not have been hidden at the time. It just wouldn't have been spoken about, which is probably how she got away with it. Um, and like, you know, Chris is saying, like the whole thing, like men have been called out for it or men have been, you know, almost you know, killed over being gay, whereas she managed to get away with it for her whole life. I think there is kind of that double standard there where they're not going to ask her what she's doing. Um, you know, they'll just assume that she's looking for a husband or something. Um, so that's a really interesting kind of recent example that has been very highly publicised um, in recent years as well. It's it's interesting that she went to such an extent to hide that in the walls of her house as well, um, and we're definitely we probably take for granted some of these sources, uh, and how dangerous it was for some of these people to be writing down these experiences. 
Um, so it was very brave of her to do this. Now, we've touched on the L and the G and the B uh, in LGBT+. But you know, we haven't touched on transgenderism yet. Um, Chris, in the medieval period, you know, was how were transgender uh, people treated or or was it such a concept within that medieval period and earlier uh, another great question and i'm probably going to answer it in a similar way it's it's not something that it, it doesn't crop up as much as it, it it probably should i think the idea of 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 being transgender or or probably gender to be honest is a much later creation and I don't think there was room in society for people to, you know, experiment with, with, you know, either, you know, gender or sexuality or a mix of the two. I just, you know, Rosie made a great point about the difference in the way uh, gay men and gay women have been treated. And I think that's another really good point that I don't think that women were given the same treatment because they weren't considered it wasn't considered important because at the end of the day you know it's just women that was i'm assuming that was you know the the majority of the kind of thought process obviously i don't i don't think that um but um and i think that's why you know gay men through history have have received the more public backlash i'm not you know saying that you know gay women and um, trans people of history have not they absolutely have but I think because it was considered more important they would get the bulk of the um, backlash um, one more modern example of let's, let's say cross-dressing as such that I that I, I found out recently was during the first world war um, which I know is definitely not the question you asked me but you're getting this answer oh that's anyway. okay don't worry <laughs> Um, is obviously, uh, if you know anything about the, 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 gr the Great War, the First World War, is um, you know, millions and millions of men were mobilized across the world, but uh, the, the Russians um, actually mobilized uh, some uh, small uh, female units. Um, but before that, there was actually cases of women signing up, uh, dressing as men, um, cutting their hair and you know, hiding as men, so they could fight and serve in the Russian army, um, which is a, a kind of a different take, I guess, on, on LGBTQ history. But it's still really important that it's always kind of been there, but I just don't think it's been, been documented, reported, recorded, or understood in any way. And, and you touch on another really good point there, uh, Chris, that this isn't just a... A history of LGBT people. It's a history of marginalised people, mm. uh, and a history of people whose stories haven't necessarily necessarily been have been spoken about. And we're having the same with women's history at the moment. It is having a a rise uh, in popularity and attention in the public sphere uh, because it's the voice of the marginalised. It's a voice that hasn't been heard. For so long because history has been dominated by you know white men telling the stories that we we know um mm. rosie how has uh, the people who write history kind of straight washed history as a whole really yeah i mean there's a lot of you know straight washing going on there's some people that were gay that we don't know are gay um that we've kind of remembered maybe for other things or their sexuality isn't mentioned i'd say like people like lord byron he was famously bisexual um you've got the bloomsbury group which is people like virginia wolf and vita sackville west i mean no one kind of i mean i need now now people remember virginia wolf and vita sackville west for being in a relationship but at the time it was kind of like oh well you write books and you're a socialite it was you know people did not talk about it um and a lot of the things that we know so like alan turing um only came out 
recently, I mean, probably within the last, I'd say, 10, 20 years, um, did we know about kind of the sexuality of people and actually kind of discussing it? Because, I mean, if you think about maybe even history books that were written 30 years ago, there's no mention of sexuality, even in things that are so very obviously interlinked with it. Um, and even when you kind of look at like, I don't know, court records and stuff like that, it's just very, they tr try and not say what it is because they don't want to be so, I mean, because they thought it was wrong, they didn't want to be so grotesque to describe things and, you know, go into any details. So it's even interesting to kind of look at how they tried to censor themselves back then even compared to now. I mean, I think in the next 20 years, we'll find out even more about LGBT history that we didn't know because just so much gets found or, you know, re-remembered that had tried to be hidden. And this, this finding of information out about these kind of things now I think is really important because it's giving these, giving young people who idolise these figures or idolize you know a trade like being a poet or being a writer or an artist you know as soon as they find out that someone like lord byron is a member of, or was a member of the lgbt community it gives those figures for these young people to look up to and i think that's quite quite important really now with lord byron uh we touch upon a difficult area of history for or a difficult part of many LGBTs LGBT plus people's lives, which is which is being outed. You know, why that how how prevalent was being outed for some of these these LGB, LGBT plus people within earlier historic periods, Chris? I think um it's it's always been very difficult and I can only imagine, you know, as, as a, as a straight guy that, that coming out is in, is an incredibly difficult part of anybody's life, you know, even today, but, you know, you mentioned, um, Lord Byron who was outed by somebody. Um, he didn't even have the power over his own, um, sexuality at that point. And he unfortunately had to, um, flee the country, um, probably in fear for his life. Um, if not just his reputation. Um, I think one, um, a good example um, is, is Edward II, who, like I said, is, uh, who does feature in, um, as does Lord Byron and Virginia Woolf uh, in the upcoming edition of the magazine. Um, Edward II is famous for being a naff king um, and having relationships with men. And he's a kind of an odd example because he, it was never really addressed in a kind of straight up the middle, are you gay or, you know, is the king gay, you know, kind of question. It was, you know, he was, he was known to have male favourites, as was, you know, uh, James I and VI, um, what, 300 years later? Even, no, even more so, 400 years later. Um, you know, they were known to have male favourites and it was kind of like hiding in plain sight you know, there was obviously it was not it didn't go down well at all, as you'll read in, you know, many, many of the articles in the next edition. A lot of them are have kind of similar themes. Um, but being outed um, was a, you know, being, you know, called out as a for lack of for a, it's a horrendous phrase, but we'll use the historical term of sodomite was incredibly damaging. And, and as with pretty much everything in, let's say, you know, let's take medieval England, for example, everything was about reputation and anything to damage a person's reputation, um, you know, would, would be used, I guess, for the right price or the right situation. Um, so, you know, it was very much, you know, in the cases of, of Edward II, um, it's very much used as a political tool. Um, you know, some were able to deal with it with better than others and, and some were much more unfortunate in their eventual treatment than others. I won't, you know, give too much away because I'd very much like you to read um, the articles 
Um, but um, yeah, as, as it is today, um, being outed by somebody else is, is a truly awful thing to do uh, or to have happen to you. And like I said, I think, you know, people don't really change. And I can imagine a thousand years ago, 200 years ago, two years ago, you know, having the rug pulled from underneath you um, and such a big part of who you are as a person put on display without your consent and out of your control will have been incredibly, um, incredibly damaging on, on all levels. And we still see those dam- that, that damage mm. and that taking away of power playing out in newspapers today. Um, and it's interesting to see that those things are possibly happening in medieval life as well. Now, LGBT plus history, as we've talked about, is entwined with so many different areas of history, women's history, the the history of politics and the history of power and the the history of authority uh, and literature. But one area that it does touch upon and is is entwined with, Rosie, is the the history of disabilities. They're very closely aligned. Now, how are these? How are these two, on the surface, very different areas of history? How are they connected? Yeah. So this is actually what one of our features is um, about in the magazine. Um, so obviously, for the more comprehensive and um, detailed answer, then definitely read um, <laughs> edition six. Um, because it will tell you everything that you need to know. Um, But yeah, it's very intertwined. Um, I mean, a lot of kind of belief um, was that being gay was kind of a mental mental disability. Um, So a lot of people would have been kind of maybe classed as disabled um, just for being gay. and so that's like pretty interesting and i mean we still kind of have it today with the kind of gay conversion therapy um which would have been i guess some therapies would have developed in you know mental asylums when we think of some of the reasons why people were in mental asylums um back in the past you know i'm sure that being gay was probably one of the reasons because they would try and meditate like medicalize i don't know if that's the right word but they would try and fix you with medicine because they believe something was wrong with you um which you know it hasn't gone away today i mean i think in this country it's either now illegal or very nearly illegal to offer gay conversion therapy or any sort of medicines for being gay whereas you know in other countries it is fully allowed to try and stop someone from being gay um so I mean, that is one way that it's definitely very heavily intertwined. Um, And it's just, I think it's just horrible, isn't it? To think about that someone just because they feel a certain way was considered to be mentally disabled. It is is truly harrowing, especially as a, a white straight male. I can never, I will never experience these kind of treatments uh, and never understand the pain and suffering that these people go through um and, and my heart really does go out to all of them now obviously we've i don't want to give away too much of this this latest issue but but it is a fantastic issue and what what issue or what articles do you think people should you know look out for really so we're gonna go for you rosie first and then chris you could tell us some things you want people to look out for yeah so um our two features are on disability history and like lgbt and how they're connected um and also we have another feature on the bloomsbury group which is you know a really interesting period of history um and i'd also say another one that i really enjoyed reading um was written by ollie green um about his own experience with um the education sector in the UK when he was growing up so he's not much older than us he's you know 
um, in his 30s. So, you know. He'll love that. Yeah. It's... He'll absolutely love that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying yeah, that to him. I mean. <laughs> No, and, and those are really great articles and um having worked with Ollie on his article uh it's a really it's a really powerful emotional article so yeah definitely there are definitely three articles to really look out for and chris which which articles are you keeping your eyes out for, your eye out for i mean i've mentioned it a few times and it won't shock anybody to uh work out that i wrote um the ed the second article and i do hope people you know do like that one because Edward II is known for being, like I said, a pretty naff king. Um, I think he's quite a misunderstood man. Um, and I think I found it very important to tell his story as a person. Um, there's all, obviously, it's a very, very um, abridged version of, of the man, Edward. Um, but I'm hoping I can, I can convince some people that he may have been a terrible king, um, but he was probably a perfectly nice man, um, which in you know the 14th century was not necessarily too common, um, as well as my article. Um, we have a wonderful article on the Lollard Knights, another medieval one. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it's linked to um, nobility, um, but another very, very cool example um, of, again, LGBTQ history hidden in plain sight, which when it comes to medieval England is, is pretty much where you have to go um, for your LGBTQ history. We also have a wonderful article on bisexual buccaneers, um, LGBTQ plus during the age of piracy. Uh, pirates and being gay is not necessarily uh, two things that you would say go hand in hand, but um, I'm not going to say too much about this one because it is a really good read. Um, but yeah, anybody that's into pirates or anything else, seafaring during the 18th century wide, you know, that, that wide world, um, I'm really excited for people to uh, to read that one as well. And this is this is really shaping up to be a fantastic edition of the Historians Magazine. And having looked at some of these articles, everyone's definitely in for a treat on this. So it is definitely a magazine to get your hands on when it comes out. Now I'm going to circle back to you two. Now I know as historians you love talking about yourselves. So <laughs> <laughs> you two have had great success with the historians magazine but now you're setting up another entity alongside all of the entities that you have i think rosie you you work on a 1920s podcast you have the magazine you have a busy job chris you have the history corner blog you appear on everyone's podcast and and you have and you both maintain your your own really really busy and active social media presences so what is this this new venture from you both? I'll let you go, Rosie. Um, yeah, so our new venture is called Past and Present Media. Um, I mean, firstly, we have a podcast coming out. Um, I think we're launching it on the 1st of February, actually, um, which explores the past and the present. So it's a real mix between um, mine and Chris's um, interest. So I'm more of a kind of modern historian um, and Chris is more of medieval. So we thought we should combine those two and just make something out of it. So the podcast is coming out really soon. Um, we're also going to be working on video content, um, lesson plans, you know, anything that you can think of to make history just more exciting and more available to people than we're on it. Yeah, we've got um, we've got big plans for 2022 and beyond. Um, essentially, like Rosie said, we want to continue what we've been doing with the magazine and make history fun again, uh, make it accessible, make it relevant. Um, that's one thing that we're really going to try and get across in the podcast is, you know, history is relevant, whether it was, you know, from 10 years ago or 800 years ago. Um, it's all super important and at the end of the day we're all doing this because it's fun and we get something out of it uh, and we want to be able to put that back into the community um, whether it's uh, helping children to learn you know giving parents and adults you know uh, opportunities to teach their own children or relatives you know teachers you know we want to we want to help where we can 
Um, and yeah, we're, I'm really, really looking forward to getting um, stuck into past and present. Um, so yeah, I guess watch this space, yeah. And for two individuals to who give so much to the community and and give so much knowledge to people, you know, I think this is a really great idea. Uh, and I really encourage everyone to go and have a look and a follow of uh, past and present media because I know there are some really exciting things coming. And I know there's some really exciting things coming from these two. Now, finally, Rosie, where can people find you if they want to interact with you more? Um, to interact with me more, then I'm History with Rosie on Instagram. Um, I think on Twitter it's History Rosie because it was too many characters. Um, but yeah, if anyone wants to uh, talk to me, if you want to see the magazine, then that's the Historian's Magazine on Instagram. And everyone knows Chris already, so I won't bother. No, I'm joking. <laughs> so Chris, if people want to talk to you, interact with you, where can they find you? I do love a podcast up here in the Stone. I'm always about somewhere lurking in yeah. the <laughs> Um, yes, you can find me at Chris Riley History on Instagram and like Rosie, Twitter cut my handle in half. So I'm at Chris Rye History, so R-I. Um, Twitter, I, to be fair, if you want to hear me talk about Yorkshire Tea and what games I'm playing, go there. If you want legit history, probably follow me on Instagram. Uh, you can also follow um, the History Corner blog, um, which Jackson mentioned earlier, which is, again, very, very similar to everything that myself and Rosie do is a safe place for people to share history to learn history um, you can go to the history corner.org um, with the actual website itself or you can follow it on instagram at history corner blog now all the links to follow the historians magazine past and present media the history corner blog rosie and chris will be in the description below so don't worry you won't miss anything from these two in the meantime if you enjoyed this episode please like subscribe review comment share whatever you'd like if you don't enjoy it you can dislike i don't mind but make sure you're enjoying history and you're enjoying what you're doing thank you very much for listening guys i really appreciate it thank you very much chris and rosie for coming on the podcast and i'll talk to you all later thank you